How are you? I'm amazing. Are you at home? I am. Well, I'm. I'm in a rental. Um, right. <laughs> we we bought a new house in Toronto, and it's a year long renovation. So I've got you. Uh, I've got my iPad propped on a laundry bin, and uh, my wife's working out in the living room. So uh, our interview <laughs> is in the bedroom. Mind you, you didn't have to do that, did you? No, that's all personal choice. <laughs> it's all a bit temporary. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I put myself in this position. Yeah, another position you're in, Ed. I mean, I think I read it's uh, 35 years since the band first got together. I mean, what, what does that feel like? Uh, on, on one hand, it feels impossible but on the other hand it would be impossible to fit in the things we've done in any less than 35 years uh you know the number of records the number of tours the uh the videos the the award shows the lack of award shows <laughs> you know we've uh it, it's been uh in, an incredible run and in some ways it feels like five years and in some ways it feels like 75 years and the other anniversary you've had is it's 25 years since one week Rose. yes what i mean what what does that mean for the band is it bit of a millstone or is it still something to celebrate how, how, how does the band feel about that well i i think i'm really lucky in that well i know i'm really lucky but i'm i'm particularly lucky in then that that song has never been an albatross for me um never been a millstone it's never been a hardship I've loved that song from the moment I wrote it. I enjoy it every time Every time we perform it. Every time we get a request, whether it's Family Guy or what we do in the shadows or uh, Jimmy Kimmel, or it, it gets requested all of the time for licenses, film, television, comedy shows, uh, you know, late night chat shows. It is the quintessential like joke of what late 90s music was like it's the easy go-to like when white guys started rapping it's uh <laughs> it's all of those jokes and i love it every time and whenever we perform it i see people my age and older singing every lyric to it like it was their rapper's delight. It was their song <laughs> that they learned every word to that put them in this vaulted club of people who knew even the fast parts, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I have a really good relationship. I know a lot of bands have a troubled relationship with big hits, and it's maybe because they didn't write it or they were... They didn't agree with the record company about releasing it as a single or whatever. There's some resentment. I just don't have that relationship with One Week. I've I've loved it for a quarter of a century. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a pension as well. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. But well, don't bite the hand that feeds, right? <laughs> so, Ed, I mean... What do you think kept the band going? I mean, 35 years, 20, well, however you measure the sort of length of the success, I mean, what what keeps the band going? I mean, obviously there's individuals in the band, but, you know, what's sure. the band ethos that means that, you know, it's it's because not that many bands keep going for, for so long and keep fresh, do they? I mean, it's, it's quite hard yeah. to... Uh, it's, it's uh, of course, it's many things, but I think it's fundamentally appreciating the incredible uh, 
the rare air that we're breathing, getting to do this thing that we love over and over and over again, getting to change, grow, incorporate, and continue to do this thing that we love, not lose, not losing sight of the fact that it's literally our dreams have come true. And it's, I think a lot of bands fall into the rut of like, ah, fuck, I got to sleep on a tour bus again. Ah, I got to get hounded by people everywhere I go. Oh, this is fucking bullshit. And I, I always want to grab those <laughs> bands by the shoulder and go, this is everything you ever wanted. And if you don't appreciate it, it goes away. <laughs> Either by uh, mistreatment by you or by you mistreating others such that they will no longer hold you in that esteem. So it's appreciating where you're at and maybe even more important from the band perspective, it's just communication amongst the band. Like it's more intense than a marriage because you not only work together, you live together, you, you sleep together, you eat together. I, I'm with my bandmates way more than I'm with my family. And it, it takes an amount of respect for each other, dedication to each other, but also communication. How are you? What do you need? How can I help you? And also, hey, you're being a fuck up right now. Like, let's <laughs> let's sort this out, which goes back to appreciating it. When you got a new or a newish album out in flight, I mean what what's that about? Um you know it's the I think I spent a period of a fairly long period where I was questioning like what the hell am I gonna write about? Like I've written so many songs now and, you know, our career peaked at some point in the early 2000s and we're probably not going to get back to that level. So what am I writing like? And I was kind of overthinking for a couple of records, I think. And this time I thought I'm going to write the best record I can for its own sake not not uh, not to achieve something outside of myself, but to achieve something within myself. I'm just gonna like, this is going to be an expression of my art. I'm a good songwriter. I'm gonna try and write some really good songs. And it's the first time in a 35 year career that we actually set aside carved in stone time for writing we've never done that which seems insane to me but uh in 35 years we've never said okay these two months are off i don't care if god himself offers us a gig at the pearly gates to welcome in the the new uh <laughs> attendees we're not taking it because this is sacred writing time and maybe as a result but for whatever reason, I had the easiest and most prolific writing period of my whole career. And I think it's because I had the time and I had the headspace to really go deep. And, you know, in the past, I would be really happy if I completed a song in a day. I would think like, wow, like, Yesterday, this song didn't exist, and today it does. That's a cool feeling as a writer, you know? And I had a day in this writing period where I finished eight songs in a single writing session. And it was kind of mystifying and wonderful. And it was like, uh, it reminded me of, I, I don't know if you remember the, Amadeus, the 
F. Murray Abraham and Tom Hulse, yeah. and he's writing, and, and F. Murray Abraham is saying, slow down, slow down, and he's trying to keep up with his notation. Um, that's what I felt like. In I was alone in, in my kitchen, and I sat down at 10 a.m., and I didn't look up till almost 10 p.m., and there were eight new songs in the world that weren't there the day before, and that was a really amazing feeling. I mean, there's a number of co-writes as well. I mean, how did how did that come about? Uh, again, I, I spent one day in that same kitchen with Donovan Woods, and another song happened. You know, uh, I went down to Kevin Griffin's place in Franklin, Tennessee, which I've been doing for over ten years now. Every time I want to write a new record, um, mostly because it's just a fun hang, and. Uh, we, you know, we are the leaders of our respective bands, Kevin in Better Than Ezra. And uh, we can really get together and make fun of each other because we're both front men and we'll, we'll both just tear into each other all day. And at the end of it, there's a great song because neither of us are in competition. We're just trying to write the best song, you know. Um, sometimes when you write with people you're in a band with, you're, you're, you want to have the best line in the song that you wrote instead of you just want the best line in the song, no matter who wrote it. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice relationship that, uh, long and, and trusted relationship that I have with Kevin. I mean, you've. You've got your songs, you've been productive. I mean, what happened in the studio? I mean, how how do you develop the songs in the studio? How sort of attached are you to them personally? And how much do the other band members sort of craft and shape? And how, how uh, the dynamics? I, I write a very skeletal song. Um, I know... I know early in the process what, how the song is going to develop, what I want the melody to do, how I want it to be supported. And I know that Jim is going to develop a bass line that progresses my melody throughout the song and supports it. I know that Kev is going to come up with some ridiculously hooky, little melodic lines to fill in all the spaces it's like if i get i just build the skeleton and i know it's sound like i put the foundation in here's a great lyric here's a great melody here we go and i just trust that jim and kev are going to hang all the proper adornments on it and we're going to have something beautiful and i don't have to tell them what that is i trust them to put their heart and soul into it and come up with those uh i mean that's the beauty of a band is letting everyone have their voice uh and tyler as the drummer tyler has always been you know my biggest support and in some ways my biggest fan you know, he's always the guy that hears the songs first and kind of loves them first, you know, and really puts his his puts his energy into capturing where I want to go with it. And I know it can be frustrating for him sometimes because I'm a drummer as well. And he'll come up with a part that's really cool. And he's worked really hard on it. I'll go, uh, I was thinking halftime for this, Ty. I, I like where you're going with this, but, you know, it's 60. It's not 120. I, but I don't spell that stuff out usually on a demo. It's, it's pretty sparse. And so, you know, I think we've been patient with each other all these years. And, and, and there's a level of trust there that, you know, He's trying to serve the song too. 
And and ultimately that's what it comes down to is is trying to make it about the song and not about ego or the musician or the the singer or whatever it is. Do what's best for the song and then all the best songs will make up the record. And who decides what the best songs are? <laughs> Well, we actually do that incredibly democratically. Um, and some of those are heartbreakers. Um, but we we literally put all the songs in a list and the band members and the producer vote. And so we have five votes and Every song that gets five stars is on the record. Every song that gets four stars is on the record. And then the songs that get three stars, we sort of have a new voting run. This record, I think, when we did the initial vote, eight songs had five votes. Something like that. It was a huge number of songs that everybody felt these are the songs that need to be on the record. So it's hard when your favorite song is not one of the five vote songs, but you have to accept that, you know, it's you're, you're just one man in a large dynamic and, you know, democracy doesn't always make the best art. Um, but it's not like it's really not like art by committee because all the songs are really, really good. And it's just a question of, you know, what everybody's attached to while we're making the record. Things change, too, I should say, like in the process, we've taken a another stab at something that everybody said, oh, that one's really come to life like. For example, on this record, it was too old. Too old, my demo was like, it was like a, a pretty arpeggiated folk song. It was, uh, it would have been at home on a, um, you know, like a, a, a 1970s Americana folk record. Um, and I really liked the lyric, but it was very much couched in this sweet acoustic presentation. And then one day in pre-production, Jim and I started playing it like this Tom Petty kind of dirge rock, like plow. And we went, holy shit, that's how that song's supposed to be. And it went from not on the producer's list to on the producers, this has to be a focus track. So things change when when you allow each other a little breathing room. I mean, talking about change, I mean, I read you'd moved into the ice cream business and the and the cruise business as well. I mean, look, what's that <laughs> meant for the band? I mean, yeah, well, we we did a bunch of cruises. We haven't done one in a while. Um, we, uh, yeah, we did an ice cream flavor with Ben and Jerry's for years. And then we did a, a frozen custard flavor with, a uh, a, a shop just over the border in the U S and those, those things are fun for us. It's just an opportunity to do some good, you know, with Ben and Jerry's, we said, yeah, we'll do a flavor. It was, if I had a million flavors. And it was this kitchen sink type ice cream with espresso beans and chocolate and caramel ribbons. And we said, great, it's a great idea. It's really fun, but we don't need to see any money from it. So we'd like it if you would donate our uh, fees and royalties to literacy, for, to adult literacy uh, campaigns. And we've raised a whole bunch of money for ABC um, literacy in Canada. And then same thing with the custard. We're really popular in upstate New York and this little mom and pop custard shop 
wanted to do frozen custard is a thing i don't know if they have it in the uk but it's uh, don't know i've heard of it and it yeah it sounds nice yeah. yeah it's not it's not in the uk yeah it's like the world's thickest milkshake um and it's it's much more rich and it's like a milkshake you could only really eat with a spoon um and we love this place that's right around the corner from the venue we always play and they came to us and said you know can we do a, a flavor uh, tie in with the band and similarly we said yeah we'd love to that'd be really fun but can we donate all of our proceeds to local community funds? And they said, amazing. We'd love to do that. So we do silly things like that. And whenever we do, it's usually in the benefit of others. I mean, you, you've had your 35 years. You've been successful in terms of album sales, et cetera. I mean, does the band still see yourselves as outsiders or do you think things have normalized a bit? You've, you know, as people grow older, yeah, the edges get yeah. smooth. I mean, how, how do you see yourselves now? I think we have always seen ourselves as kind of outsiders and underdogs, despite all of our success and the longevity of the band. We're still kind of outside of the mainstream, really, you know. I, I often say, like, show me another band that's been around 35 years, sold 15 million records, had international number one hits, and has never been on the cover of a major music publication. No Grammys. Like, we are, despite all of the accolades, we are kind of outside of the system still, which is kind of lovely in its own way you know <laughs> because <laughs> we we know that we're kind of self-made and self-sufficient um and we've done all of this kind of on our own terms and we still do it on our own terms so uh yeah in some ways we have always felt like outsiders but on the other hand it's sort of like the data is irrefutable we're still here. We're still doing it. Uh, you know, I, I guess we feel like outsiders, but we don't resent it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we got nothing to complain about, I guess, is, is how that translates. <laughs> All right, what can the people in the UK expect when you come over? What's, what's going to be like well, this time? This is the, I think this might be the first time we've ever toured the UK first on a new record. Um, we haven't toured this record yet. It just came out in September and we've done a couple of, you know, we did a 35th anniversary show in Toronto where we played a couple of the songs and we did uh, a couple songs around the holidays um, that were really holiday shows. So, this is the first in-flight tour, and generally we've done about, you know, 75 shows in North America before we make it over to the UK. So this will be a rare opportunity for our UK fans to see us not very well rehearsed. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I uh, we always look forward to to playing there it in in all of the many times we've been there it's only recently that we've been able to turn a profit on touring in the uk because it's a very expensive proposition for us but we keep coming back because the fans are amazing there and we love the shows we hate the tour buses we we hate the it's so much more like for a north american touring band touring in the uk is a litany of complaints <laughs> but we come back year after year after year because we love playing there um so we always look forward to it always 
I mean, if this is the first time you've you've played songs off the new album, I mean, how exciting is that going to be for people and yourselves? I mean, you well, know. it's uh, you know, as an artist, it's really great to be excited about your new material, and. But we also respect that a lot of people are coming because they grew up with the music or they, you know, they can't wait to hear one week or they can't wait to hear if I had a million dollars. We're doing all that stuff. We always have. We always will. Uh, I feel like, you know, we're going to play 22 songs in a night. So we might play five songs off the new record. You know, that that means the audience is getting 17 songs they already know. So um, I think it's, it's, it's a fair trade-off. <laughs> <You know? laughs> hey, Martin, we're going to have to wrap this up. You can have one more question. Yeah, uh, one last question, Ed. America and UK, we like to ask people, what are you listening to now? So three tracks, albums, or artists? Can be any genre, old, new, just what you're enjoying that you think other people will also enjoy. Uh, it's a quick list for me. Um, Bahamas, uh, Afi Yervanen, um, he has a new record called Boot Cut, but I love all of his records. Check out Earth Tones. Um, Sam Weber, another Canadian artist who coincidentally plays guitar on uh, Bahamas previous record uh, but Sam Weber makes beautiful records that's W-E-B-E-R he's a west coast uh, Canadian artist and third I would say what am I listening to I'm going to go with uh, Rose Cousins uh, east coast Canadian singer who um uh, she has a, a song um, on her, I guess it's one record ago. I can't remember if it's two records ago or one record ago. Um, that reduced me to tears on a flight when I listened to it for the very first time. So check out Rose Cousins. She's amazing. Thanks for that, Ed. I think there's you've got another interview coming up, I think, by the sound of it. <laughs> I do indeed. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Ed. Good luck. Yeah, nice talking to you, Martin. And enjoy the UK. All the best.